Uh, so, uh, yes, I would like to start by introducing um, uh, our uh, uh, visiting uh, professor today, uh, Dr. Amy Motl, uh, who is originally uh, from Massachusetts, and she attended medical school at Albert Einstein uh, in New York. Uh, she went to the University of North Carolina, where she did her residency, fellowship, and obtained a master degree in public health. Dr. Model has been uh, on faculty at the UNC Division of Nephrology since 2006, and she's currently an associate professor. Um, she's a clinical expert on diabetic kidney disease, aglomeronephritis, and vasculitis, and her research is really centered around epidemiology, pathology, and treatments for diabetic kidney disease, and its intersection uh, with, uh, di uh, between diabetes and glomeronephritis. Uh, she's uh, actively um, uh, funded by NIH, um, um, having um, projects um, um, on diabetic kidney disease and beyond, and she's going to share her exciting work with us today. Thank you so much for visiting. Thank you, Penelope. It's so lovely to be here, and it's, I was especially relieved that it was warm today, so thank you for the weather. Um, so, as Penelope said, so I actually started my career really focusing on diabetes, and then about five to seven years ago, um, we had a need for somebody to become a glomerular disease vasculitis specialist, and so I filled that role. And so my, um, my uh, template is very interesting in my, in my clinic because I have garden variety diabetes, you know, lupus, vasculitis, but what I've really enjoyed is merging those two interests and using a lot of my expertise in glycemic control, metabolic syndrome, and obesity in my patients with glomerulonephritis. So it's kind of a smattering that you're gonna see today. We'll see how this works out. Um, these are my disclosures. And so this is the outline of my talk for today. I wanna just touch a little bit about what is diabetic kidney disease because I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about that. Um, but I also wanted to talk to you a little bit and make sure everyone is astutely aware of the growing problem of type two diabetes in youth. Uh, I was part of a long, um, longitudinal study looking at youth onset diabetes, so people with type 1 and type 2 diagnosed before the age of 20. Um, so I'll touch on that a little bit in a, a paper that we have upcoming in that field. And then I also have an interest in pathology in diabetes and really the intersection of diabetes and FSGS because we all know that FSGS is very common in people with diabetes and it's very difficult to ascertain what is really coming from diabetes, what's coming from FSGS, and I'll show you that there are lesions actually uh, that look very similar to cr crescents, uh, but are really due to um, the prolifer or the um, lesions that we see in the blood vessels in diabetes. And so I'll talk a little bit about those in terms of their prognostication. And then I wanna to touch a little bit about my interest in glomerular disease and diabetes uh, in terms of how diabetes impacts the diagnosis and endpoints in glomerular diseases. And then I really wanna delve a bit, time allowing, into some therapies and the future of therapies in diabetes and CKD in general. Of course, SGLT2 inhibitors are foremost. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about them in isolation. I think we've had that ad nauseum. Um, but I'm happy to, t to talk after the uh, session if anyone has interest. But I really want to talk a little bit about GLP-1 agonists. I use them all the time in my patients with and without diabetes, as well as the non-steroidal MRAs. So first, what is diabetic kidney disease? So when I was in medical school in the late 90s, we termed it diabetic nephropathy. And we assumed that meant typical diabetic glomerulosclerosis with mesangial expansion, Kimmel-Steele-Wilson nodules. But then we found that really what we were looking at was just albuminuria. And we know that albuminuria is a very important prognosticator in kidney disease, but it has many problems, which I'll touch on as well. Um, so then we started talking about diabetic kidney disease. So kidney disease, again, assumed to be due to diabetic glomerulosclerosis, uh, 
But then we came to find that really we were just talking about people who had diabetes and either a low GFR or albuminuria. And so in 2020, KDGO coined the term diabetes and CKD because we really don't know what the heck we're talking about when somebody has diabetes and kidney disease. It could span the gamut. And so just to touch on again, albuminuria and diabetes, the schematic that you see here below um, was originally a unidirectional uni, um, uh, natural history of diabetes and kidney disease. That's what I learned when I was training. So you start out with your hyperfiltration. You got micro, macro, albuminuria, decreased GFR, and end-stage kidney disease. But we know now that um, some people, about half of people with diabetes, will have no albuminuria but a low GFR. We also know that albuminuria can regress, and not even just moderate microalbuminuria, but even more severe, even nephrotic range albuminuria can regress significantly. So while it is exceedingly important, and I'm not dissing it, I do want us to recognize that there are limitations to looking at albuminuria in people with diabetes. And so these two light mic micrographs show us what I'm talking about. So on the left here, we see a typical glomerulus in diabetic kidney disease where we have mesangial expansion, maybe the beginning of a Kimmel steel wilson nodule, not truly formulated yet, I would say. Um, but our interstitium looks good. Our tubules are back to back. But then if we look at the right-hand micrograph, we can see somebody who also has diabetes. And yes, they would have diabetic glomerulosclerosing, diabetic glomerulosclerosis, according to how it's diagnosed on light micrograph. You can see that there is some mesangial expansion, but it's pretty minimal, especially when you look at that in comparison to your tubules and your interstitium. So here we have the arrows pointing to the interstitium the long arrow, and then the smaller arrow pointing to the tubules. These are very sick tubules. They're flattened. They're starting to lose their brush border. We're seeing fibrosis with expansion of the interstitium in between our tubules. So what is going on in, in that person is probably significantly different from what's going on in the person depicted on the left-hand side. But to make it even more complicated, now we have kidney precision medicine and our expansion of multi-omic therapies is showing us that not only is it not the clinical markers that are necessarily important, but maybe it's not even the histology that's important in terms of what's going on on a very basic molecular basis. So this was a case report from KPMP, a 66-year-old woman who had had hypertension for 30 years Diabetes only for five years, but she had some significant albuminuria, 500. Her creatinine was two. And if you look at the light micrograph on the lower right-hand corner, you can appreciate that this is most consistent with hypertensive glomerulosclerosis because, yes, we see a little tiny bit of mesangial expansion, but practically nothing. We see one uh, globally still getting used to this pointer, one globally sclerosed glom. But otherwise, they look pretty good. But we have a lot of inflammation in the interstitium. We see that we're getting proteinaceous casts in the tubules. Those are pointed out by the letter C that you can see on the left side of that micrograph. But then when they did the multi-omic uh, uh, studies in this person, they did find markers of hypertension, but they also found a lot of markers that were consistent with ongoing diabetic kidney disease, so glucose transporters, glycosphingolipids, podocyte injury and apoptosis, which we really don't see typically in hypertensive kidney disease. So in this lady, it would make you wonder, well, if I had a molecule that could target um, these particular processes, I would not be going by her uh, histology, I'd be going by what her uh, molecular pathophysiology is, and I think that's really the direction that we're going to be going. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what I uh, discussed earlier, this 
study that I had the opportunity to participate in as the kidney person, the only kidney person. Um, it was called the Search for Diabetes in Youth Study, and it captured people with youth onset diabetes less than 20, and it could be type 1 or type 2. And they captured people really from the onset of disease, so their first study visit was less than a year after their initial diagnosis. Um, and what we saw is that really this is a growing phenomenon if you look at the incidence of type 1 versus type 2. Um, so 2017, you can see the prevalence in the type 1s versus the type 2s. And if you look at the total, the type 2s are about a third of the prevalence of type 1s. But this is an entity that used to be really almost never seen. And if you look at certain races and ethnicities, you can see that actually the type 2s are more prevalent than the type 1, specifically in American Indian uh, youth as well as Hispanic youth. And you can see that the rate of growth is actually starting to outpace that of type 1, again, in almost all of the different races and ethnicities, including the non-Hispanic white stratum. And if you look by age group, sure, it's really rare that we see anyone under the age of 12 getting type 2 diabetes, but those with type 1, or those who are 10 to 20 years, the rate of growth of type 2 diabetes is again um, two to threefold as fast as type 1s. And this is important for us to recognize as nephrologists and internists because these people. Um, are really going to stress our healthcare system more than we've ever really seen before. And so one of the things that we did in the search study was to partner with the TODAY study. So the TODAY study was a clinical trial of metformin and other therapies in youth onset type 2 diabetes. And then they transitioned and started to follow these youth uh, longitudinally over time. And they've, they've been seeing them for almost 20 years at this point. So we came up with a harmonized approach to look at really hard outcomes because we all have lots of studies, you know, on pulse wave velocity, albuminuria, non-proliferative retinopathy, so markers of what could potentially be end-stage organ disease, but not the real deal. And so that's what we wanted to really look at: what's going on in terms of, you know, vision-threatening retinopathy, cataracts chronic kidney disease, end-stage kidney disease. Um, and so we asked these participants at their visits, you know, have you had any of these ha things happen, these horrible things happen to you? And if they said yes, we got the records and we adjudicated it. So there were two clinicians in each study who adju adjudicated these endpoints. The difference between these two studies that is important to note, however, is that the TODAY study saw them every year, whereas the SEARCH study only saw them every five years, so we had less opportunity to ask them. But we actually found very similar results in both. And so here is the um, table just showing the characteristics of these people. So the SEARCH study only ha was the only one that had type 1s. Type 2s were in both the SEARCH and TODAY study. And of course, you can see the type 2s had a later onset um, at four, 13, 14 years, still very frightening to me. Age at their last visit, so we're talking about people who are well under 30 when they're having these endpoints that I'm about to show you. Their diabetes duration was then less than 15 years. The A1C that I'm showing you was actually the A1C that they presented with. Because of the differences in study design, we really didn't have the ability to look at longitudinal A1C, um, but presumably they were about the same. Um, I did highlight the BMI of the type 1s, so we know that the type 2s are, are very much obese, but we're seeing a growing uh, prevalence of obesity in type 1, so we're seeing really a cross-pollination of metabolic syndrome and over pancreatic insufficiency in our type 1s, which probably is going to bring about uh, a more severe phenotype as well. And so what we found is for the microvascular diseases, the risk was more than twofold higher in the people with youth onset type 2 than type 1, 56 events per 10,000 person years versus 22. And for macrovascular events, because we also sought 
arrhythmia diagnoses, MIs, congestive heart failure, strokes, which did happen in the type 2s. So that was almost fourfold higher in the type 2s. And so focusing on the kidney, there was really no CKD or end-stage kidney disease reported in the type 1s, whereas it was very much prevalent in the type 2, low uh, prevalence rate or incidence rates as you would expect. But again, these are people who are 25 years old, and that's really frightening. The one complication that was more common in type 1s was acute kidney injury, and it was almost always associated with uh, DKA. So pretty much expected. And so if you look at the composite microvascular events, because a picture is always worth a thousand words, you can see that the rate of events for both microvascular disease on the left and macrovascular disease on the right was abysmal in type 2s, which are depicted in red, versus blue, uh, which was the type 1s. So now I'm going to go back again, sorry to zigzag, but now I want to go back to our pathology because this is some work that I've um, really enjoyed doing with our nephropathologist. I don't know if anyone's heard the name Charles Jeanette, but he's a pretty well-known nephropathologist and he's fantastic. Um, we looked at our clinical biopsies done at UNC between 95 to 2011. And we looked to see what was the long-term follow-up. What was the rate of end-stage kidney disease in people? What was the rate of death, hospitalization? But we were specifically looking at people with just diabetic glomerulosclerosis. So people who had superimposed lesions were not, not included here. Um, so we found 155 that met our inclusion criteria, 109 who had longitudinal follow-up, and very diverse sample as we see in most of our clinical biopsy samples in diabetes. People were middle-aged. At the time of, of their biopsy, their A1C was actually quite well controlled, 6.8, probably because of the severity of their kidney disease. Their GFR uh, was 22 uh, at the time of their biopsy, you know, with a range of 15 to 37, but nonetheless extremely low. And they had a huge amount of proteinuria, four to five grams. Um, and I'm not showing you here, but they had pretty significant albuminuria as well. I think I might show you in the next slide. Um, but, you know, having a clinical biopsy in somebody with diabetes is kind of a poor prognostic indicator in and of itself. So 26% of these people died in the follow-up over just a couple of years, um, and 56% of people uh, hit end-stage kidney disease at a median of just nine months after their biopsy. So this is a really busy table, but I'm going to try and walk you through it, so bear with me. So it's just starting on the left, if we look at the univariate models, and these are, um, these are looking at time to end-stage kidney disease using a competing risk model for death. Um, so just looking at the clinical characteristics, age didn't parse out, but black race certainly did. Baseline GFR, as you would expect, did. Proteinuria didn't, I think because of the fact that everybody just had horrible proteinuria, it just kind of <laughs> uh, watered it all down. Um, then if you look at the glomerular characteristics, mild mesangial expansion versus more severe was protective. Global glomerular sclerosis was um, a negative prognostic indicator, but none of the others really were telling. So not Kimmel steel Wilson nodules, maybe borderline. Segmental sclerosis, we looked at lesions like mesangiolysis, glomerular hyalinosis, and extracapillary hypercellularity. So let me tell you what I mean by that, because that was Charles Jeanette's choice. Um, he's very particular about things like this. So basically, we're looking at cells in Bowman space. So yeah, is that what we see with a crescent? It is. These are not crescents but they definitely can fool you as such. And I will say that there are other, there's at least one, if not two other studies that actually show that collapsing FSGS is significantly more common in diabetes than in people without diabetes. And the lesions are, are practically indiscernible. So it does beg the question of whether that's truly FSGS or is that really bad diabetes. Moving on to interstitial characteristics, fibrosis, we always see that that's telling. 
vascular characteristics, arteriosclerosis was negative. Arteriosclerosis, we didn't have a sample size, I think, that would have uh, brought that out because we didn't sample the larger arteries enough to be able to show that. But then what we really wanted to do was to just look at the glomerulus itself. So if we take these all these clinical characteristics and we throw in all of these glomerular characteristics that had a marginal p-value of 0.1, which was essentially all of them except mesangiolysis, which ones are more telling? And so what we see in the glomerular box in the middle here um, is that mild mesangial expansion held as a protective factor, but now we're seeing segmental sclerosis start to pop out, so 2.17-fold two, 2 increased risk for end-stage kidney disease, as does this extracapillary hypercellularity. And then in the fully adjusted model to the right, we threw in the clinical characteristics along with these glomerular ca characteristics that I have bolded in the glomerular model, um, and really, it, it stuck. It was the segmental sclerosis, the mild mesangial expansion, and the extracapillary hypercellularity. So what is going on with these people? Is this a different phenotype of disease, or is it just more severe disease? Um, time will tell. I do have another study to suggest that maybe it's a different phenotype. Um, but I did want to stop first and show you what I mean by this extracapillary hypercellularity. So on the left panel A, you can see a typical diabetic uh, glomerulus with Kimmel steel wilson nodules. And then in panel B, we're starting to see adhesions with some fibrotic uh, and cellular lesions in Bowman's space. But in C, it's kind of nice because you see the very early stage of the formation of these extracapillary hypercellular lesions where there's just one layer. And then you can see over here that they grow and they grow and they grow. And so what is that? So there's some theories that maybe the um, epithelial cells from Bowman space are creeping down to try and uh, transform into podocytes as there's increasing podocytopathy. But what Charles found um, here is by changing the staining characteristics, so now I'm looking at these two on the right, and they are both the exact same micrograph. So you see the collection of the extracapillary hypercellularity. Whoops. But you can see on B that there's this little black blip inside of it, and that's, that's uh, the basement membrane. So really what we think is happening is there's just such severe formation of aneurysms that they're rupturing and causing this extracapillary hypercellularity. So next I want to move to another study that I've had the uh, pleasure of participating that's going to show something similar. So the Trident study is a private-public partnership between uh, UPenn and multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies. And the goal here was to accrue research tissue from people with diabetes undergoing clinical biopsy for the purpose of doing multi-omic therapies to find new biomarkers as well as um, potential new targets for treatment. Um, he, we did do an interim analysis um, a couple of years ago. Uh, there are now over 300 biopsies that we have, so we're almost done. Um, but I just wanted to show you some, some basic uh, characteristics at the time we did this inter, interim um, analysis. So primary reason for biopsy is proteinuria and rapid GFR loss, which is obviously why we're seeing such severe disease in these people who are undergoing clinical biopsy. They are around 53, um, predominantly male, again, very um, great representation, unfortunately, from minorities, so it was 32 percent black, 35 percent Hispanic. And so they did an unbiased cluster modeling. So basically, what is that? It's basically throwing in all of the um, variables that you think might be important and doing machine learning to sort out how do these different variables cluster together, and will that give us different phenotypes? 
And so the best cluster that was most representative of differences was three clusters. And so in the red, we have cluster one. Those were the people with pretty mild disease. Their GFR was like 40, 50. The structural changes weren't bad. They had very low rates of end-stage kidney disease. But cluster two and three were both pretty severe, but cluster two was the worst. They had the worst structural changes and the highest rates of end-stage kidney disease. So, which begs the question, are these really different phenotypes or are these different severities? So let me see if I can walk, walk you through these different schematics, which are kind of hard to interpret. But basically, they are putting the characteristic, characteristics around the periphery, and the further out that the corresponding colored dot goes is the higher um, numeric or ordinal value for that particular cluster. So for clinical characteristics, I highlighted in red because that's really where they started to uh, spread out beyond where the blue and the green were. Otherwise, the blue and the green were pretty much right on top of each other, so pretty much the same clinical characteristics. But the red had a higher GFR, um, had a lower UPCR, so much better. If we look at now the light pathology and the electron microscopy, we can see that the red is just kind of a shrunken version of the blue and the green. So it's just a mild version. But the blue and the green differ a little bit in several ways. So here we can see that arteriolar hyalinosis was more prominent in cluster three. There was more um, mesangial hyalinosis and there were greater difference in differences in the GBM. Whereas for cluster two, the worst one, we were seeing a lot more mesangiolysis, which is really what's going to lend towards um, a lot of these aneurysms that are then going to lead to this glomerular epithelial hyperplasia, which is the same exact thing as what I, what Charles had termed this extracapillary hypercellularity. I wish people would just use the same name. It's much less confusing. Um, as well as more uh, podocyte involvement in the cluster two, the green. So, you know, really reinforces what I had, what we had shown in our prior analysis. And there's another study that shows the same thing that I don't have time to, to show. But we are getting to the point where we're really able to parse out these different phenotypes. Okay, so that talks about the pathology in diabetes. But then I mentioned the fact that I'm also a glomerular disease specialist. And so, you know, about 15 to 20% of people who have glomerular disease uh, have diabetes. So it's actually, diabetes is overrepresented in people with glomerular nephritis, which is interesting because CureGN, uh, which you guys are a site for, the Cure Glomerulopathy Network, actually excluded people with diabetes because they didn't want to complicate the picture. They wanted just pure glomerulonephritis. And so we collect IgA, FSGS, minimal change, and membranous. And the goals are to tell our patients why do they have this disease, what's going to happen to them, and how can we make it better for them very noble, noble goals. However, diabetes probably modifies the diagnosis. You know, are these people being uh, biopsied possibly later because we're attributing some of the changes uh, to diabetes rather than a glomerular disease? Are they having a different natural history because of the effects of diabetes on the glomerulus and the interstitium for that rate? Does it change how we treat them? Are we less likely to give them steroids? And are they less likely to respond to treatment and have worse outcomes, not only with respect to the kidney, but the cardiovascular system as well? So by excluding them, it limits generalizability, and unfortunately, it also unintentionally excluded people of minority race and ethnicity. So we put together an R01, which thankfully got funded, called Cure and diabetes. So we are um, recruiting the same exact population, but people who do have diabetes at the time of their biopsy. And so if you look at the 
uh, figure on the left, this is kind of how we visualized what we were gonna do. So Kyrgyz and diabetes in green gives us both glomerular disease and diabetes. The parent study, CureGN, just gives us glomerular disease. But then our um, interaction with the Trident study allows us to bring in people with pure diabetic glomerular sclerosis so that we can compare between these three cohorts what are the differences in epidemiology with respect to disease severity, treatment, outcomes, um, etiology predictors, novel drug therapy targets, et cetera. And so uh, we're almost two years into the study, and we didn't start recruiting until a year into the study. But we've recruited over 40 at this point. But when I uh, pulled this data, we had had 38 people. But what I want to under underscore is actually it was kind of interesting because membranous is actually the most frequent uh, glomerular disease that we're finding, which is actually opposite to the parent study. So the parent study had a really hard time finding membranous. So it's a small sample. I don't want to read too much into it, but it does beg the question, is there something about diabetes that makes people more prone to membranous? I also want to underscore the fact that, as we figured, we are recruiting mostly minority participants, so less than 50% are non-Hispanic white. And most people have actually fairly um, short-term diabetes, less than 10 years. So it will be interesting to report these results um, as they come out. But I did want to give you a little bit of insight. So we put together some um, single center data that we had at UNC that we used in order to write the grant. And so we looked at not only those same glomerular diseases, but we also looked at ANCA because we have such a huge sample of ANCA. Um, and so these are all people who have diabetes. Some of them have um, diabetic kidney disease plus, plus their glomerular disease. Other people, 56 of them, had just the glomerular disease, no diabetes on their biopsy, but they had a clinical diagnosis of diabetes. And so as you can see, they're very similar in multiple uh, different clinical um, and sociodemographic factors. The couple differences is that the people who had diabetes on their biopsy were more often using insulin, and their UPC was also significantly higher than those people who had GN alone. So probably, you know, they're just having worse podocytopathy ongoing. I also will say, if you look at the second from the bottom here, their serum albumin was actually almost statistically lower in the people with diabetes in their biopsy as well as their GN. And so when we looked at the diabetes glomerular class in each of these people, it pretty much ran the gamut. And I have illustrated for you on the slide what these different glomerular classes are. Um, but the most common was Kimmel steel wilson nodules. Not surprisingly, IFTA was worse in the people who had diabetes on their biopsy. But I was surprised, actually, that uh, acute tubular injury didn't differ. I had actually postulated that it would be more common in diabetes, but it did not appear to be. But we did see, again, that collapsing FSGS was more common in people who had diabetes on their biopsy, as well as glomerular disease, again, just lending to that same um, trend that we were seeing before. The other things that I thought were interesting on this pilot study was that there was more segmental sclerosis in those with IgA who also had diabetes. Not that shocking. Um, you know, diabetes causes segmental sclerosis, and so maybe it's from the diabetes. But one of the things that I have wondered is whether people with diabetes are actually biopsied later on, as I said, than people without diabetes, because we always attribute everything to diabetes. So that's a possibility. But it also goes to show that our MESC scores may be different. Maybe we need a different MESC score in people who have diabetes. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that the crescents that we saw in ANCA disease were more often fibr fibrous in people who had superimposed diabetes than in people who had ANCA alone. Again, bringing up the issue of were these people biopsied later on in their disease course.
And so looking at hospital rates, hospitalization rates, they're about similar between the two, but end-stage kidney disease and death rates were significantly higher in people with diabetes and glomerular disease. And so you can see that the rate was 22.5 versus 10.2 per 100 person years. But when we parsed it out according to the severity of their diabetic glomerulosclerosis, again, looking at those different diabetes classes, you can see that the people with um, more mild diabetes in their kidney had very similar outcomes to those people who had no diabetes in their kidney. And it was really just the people who had severe mesangial expansion, Kimmel steel wilson nodules, who had a worse outcome which then is another reason why I want to do cure GN diabetes because, you know, should we even immunosuppress these people um, or are we just putting them at risk unnecessarily? So stay tuned for that. So in the last 15 or 20 minutes, I wanted to talk about therapies and therapies that really have arisen in people with um, diabetic kidney disease, but I think therapies which we can definitely use in our patients with other kidney diseases, and I use this all the time in my patients. So I am giving out, yes, SGLT2 inhibitors, which we're all using, but I'm also using GLP-1 agonists, and I would encourage people to really consider using finerenone, the non-steroidal MRA, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. SGLT2 inhibitors, we know that they reduce kidney endpoints for people with, with and without diabetes. I give them to all of my patients who have proteinuria. Um, if they don't have diabetes or if they have diabetes, I give, them I give it to them regardless of whether they have proteinuria. We know it reduces heart failure endpoints as well. GLP-1 agonists, we know that they also reduce proteinuria pretty significantly, actually, by about uh, 30%, which is as good as many kidney molecules in and of themselves. Um, they also have huge effects on weight loss and glycemic control, and so I find them to be very advantageous in my patients who I'm worried have prediabetes, that they're going to transition to diabetes when I put them on steroids. I use it because in people who are obese, just because obesity we know causes kidney disease. I use them very liberally, especially in my patients who I'm trying to get transplanted because I don't know about here, but at UNC, if your BMI is above 40, you can't get a transplant, and that's just not fair. Um, Non-steroidal MRAs, I'll talk about this data briefly, but they have been shown to reduce um, cardiovascular and, and kidney endpoints in diabetes, and we have trials underway to see if they're also helpful in people without diabetes. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about SGLT2 inhibitors. We know, you know, it all started with Embereg, this uh, top publication. These are all New England Journal of Medicine publications. Um, Embereg came out in the mid-20-teens. Um, showing us that, yes, they reduce cardiovascular endpoints, and there were signals for reductions in kidney, and then came credence, and then came DAPA CKD, and then, oh, great, we can use it in people who don't have diabetes, and then EMPA kidney just came out. I'm sure you all saw um, at the ASN, it was really the, the center point of, of that meeting, at least in my opinion. Um, showing that even people with minimal to no proteinuria and without diabetes probably also benefit. That can be argued. But here's some data on GLP-1 agonists in the kidney. So this is from the AWARD-7 study. So AWARD-7 was looking to see whether um, semaglutide was safe in people with advanced kidney disease. So they gave it to several hundred people. They randomized them to uh, semaglutide versus placebo, or excuse me, semaglutide versus insulin, uh, and they treated them for over a year, and they were mostly looking for efficacy in terms of glycemia as well as safety, but they also collected these kidney endpoints. Um, there was really no reduction in the full cohort with regards to albuminuria or EGFR. However, um, the patient population had a lot of normal albuminuria, so those are people who are at much lower risk. And again, they were only treated for about a year, so they probably just did not have the power to find that difference. And when they stratified this group according to whether they had baseline 
macroalbuminuria, so greater than 300 versus less than 300, they showed significant differences in terms of reductions in albuminuria by as much as 40%. And so here we're looking at the blue is the higher dose dilaglutide of one and a half per week, red is 0.75, and green is the insulin. Whereas in the no macroalbuminuria, as you would expect, there was really no difference. They also found, however, that there was some stabilization in GFR in these people who had baseline macroalbuminuria and hence were at higher risk. So you can see that those people who were given dilaglutide, and it didn't matter which dose they were getting, their EGFR stayed stable over the course of that year, whereas those who were given insulin showed a decline. So now we have the FLOW study that probably com will come out in the next couple of years and was a study that was specifically powered to look and see whether these GLP-1 agonists can be used for the purpose of reducing kidney outcomes as the primary endpoint. This past year, terzapatide, or Munjaru, was um, approved by the FDA, and I wanted to give it a little bit of press time as well. This drug is amazing. <laughs> like, they should put it in the water. Um, so this is actually a dual GLP, GLP, GIP1 agonist, and these two molecules work together synergistically to produce amazing losses of weight. So this is one of their studies where they looked at three different doses of terzepatide, um, and it's also a subcutaneous injection like the GLP-1s generally are, and they gave them different doses versus placebo. And so here we're looking at the percent change in body weight. And so their primary endpoint was what was the difference in percent change in body weight and how many people were achieving at least 5% loss in body weight, which is generally what we see with the GLP-1 agonists. And what they found was that people were not just losing 5 or 10, they were losing like 20, 25% of their body weight. And this was just over the course of a, of a year and a half. So it's kind of like, yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I should have said. So th this was just people with a BMI of 30. The mean BMI was 38 with, uh, I think, plus minus four or five. So they were generally between 35 and 43 BMI. So. Oh, I don't think anyone's given it to somebody with a normal weight. Not to my knowledge. Yeah. You know, it's funny because at least for GLP-1s, if you give it to somebody who has, you know, severe hyperglycemia but normal weight, it doesn't cause weight loss. So there you go. Yep. Um, they also did another study looking at kidney endpoints, and this was a separate study. So this was 1,000 people um, that they were uh, challenging terzepatide versus insulin rather than placebo. And terzepatide has actually been challenged against GLP-1 agonists as well. So it's superior to placebo, superior to insulin, superior to GLP-1s alone in terms of weight loss and glycemic control. Um, but they were looking at these kidney endpoints, so reductions in um, in primary endpoints of albuminuria and EGFR, but they also had this primary endpoint, which they looked at. On the left, we're looking at 50% um, decline in GFR, end-stage kidney disease, renal death, or new onset macroalbuminuria. And the one on the right is minus the new onset macroalbuminuria. But these were people with like, practically no or no kidney disease. So their baseline GFR was 85, plus minus 21, and their median UACR was 15, so like practically no albuminuria. Um, and as you can see on the left, um, it had pretty amazing um, impact on the primary composite endpoint. It was not significant when you take out new onset macroalbuminuria. However, again, these are people who really were not at risk of progression. So I'm still really impressed. 
And so thinking about GLP-1s and SGLT-2s, so now I'm going back to just GLP-1s, you know, we're always wondering, well, which one is better? Um, and so to me, it doesn't really matter. They're both great, and I have most of my patients on both. But that being said, so this was a study um, done out of the U.S. Veterans Administration database, and they were looking at, over time, people who were um, observationally given SGLT2s, GLP1s, DPP4s, or sulfonylureas, what was the rate of end-stage kidney disease in, or combined with a doubling of creatinine? And as you can see, the SGLT2 did best. That's the top line that's in blue. But GLP1s were right behind it in red. And both were superior to DPP4s as well as sulfonylureas. Um, so pretty amazing effects. But again, I give these to, in combination to most of my patients. And because we see synergistic effects. So these are the different... Um, mechanisms by which SGLT2s work, and those are the boxes in green, as well as the GLP-1 agonist, the boxes in lavender, and then the ones that are in the peach color are, are effects of both. That being said, I, I think they made a mistake, actually, because thermogenesis and increased brown fat is actually an effect of SGLT2 inhibitors. So that should be peach in my mind, but who am I to argue with these people? Anyways, what you can see is that you get this increased satiety, decreased gastric emptying, um, decreased steatosis, increased insulin secretion with the GLP-1s, whereas with the SGLT-2s, we get the reductions in glomerular hyperfiltration. We get the effects on reducing cardiac preload as well as probably improvements in cardiac fibrosis. We get the ketogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. And so combined, we have the ability to potentially greatly reduce kidney and cardiovascular endpoints. And so there was a study that was, again, just observational, and this is out of the UK looking at some of their EMR data, and they looked at people who were just on SGLT2s, just on GLP1s, or both, and again, this is looking at not, car not kidney endpoints, but cardiovascular endpoints, so major adverse cardiovascular events, including congestive heart failure. And what they showed, as you can see, is that in the middle here, we have our SGLT2 inhibitors. GLP-1s, actually, I was really surprised. The effect was less. And I think of GLP-1s as really being superior to SGLT2s in terms of their cardiovascular risk reduction. Um, however, when I looked at the data, the numbers were significantly smaller. And I also wonder whether there's... Um, a bias by indication as well, whether people are going on GLP-1s because they're, they're at higher risk, so I'm not really sure. But the main take home from this slide is the fact that when they put them together, there was um, what looked like a numeric reduction between the two of them. And so studies are ongoing for this as well. I'm going to just fly through the finerenone data. You probably have seen a lot of this, but there were two huge studies uh, with finerenone, which is a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor agonist, antagonist, excuse me, um, which, because of its non-steroidal structure, it actually has less risk for hyperkalemia, and it actually has a... Um, a tighter hold on the target, and it actually seems to be superior to the steroidal, so the R spironolactone and aplerinone. So there are two studies where Fidelio DKD, and we see what the um, general clinical characteristics were of these people um, depicted in blue on the CKD heat map. So these are people with albuminuria and stage 2 to uh, 3B CKD, whereas Figaro was actually, rather than targeting primarily for CKD outcomes, was primarily looking at cardiovascular outcomes. So they were actually, do I have that right? Yes. Um, they were actually looking at people with more mild CKD, so G1, G2, as opposed to G3. Um, and when you put them together, they came up with the fidelity study. <laughs>
people get paid to come up with these names, you know. I had no idea. Anyways, I'm going to skip this one. It was basically just what I was talking about, the differences between the MRAs. Um, so when you look at the fidelity data, the combined data between the two of them, you get this impressive reduction in com composite cardiovascular outcomes, reductions of 14%, heart failure particularly impressive at 22%, reductions in um, doubling of creatinine of 23%, um, and then you can also see death from any cause reduction, hospitalization for any cause reduction. So really a very similar um, uh, endpoint portfolio as we see in SGLT2 inhibitors. And so there's really reason to suspect there's a complementary mechanism profile for SGLT2s and finerenone as well. Um, so here on the left, we can see the empagliflozin is the, the gold molecule, the finerenone is the blue, and here we can look at the different mechanisms. Um, they're very much overlapping, but fat utilization, weight loss, uh, myocardial contractility, ketosis is primarily the SGL2s, whereas finerenone has um, preferential effects on smooth muscle. Uh, cell proliferation as well as muscle strain. So we actually have a study that will be starting, I think, actually, I take it back, it already started, it started last month. So the confidence study is a study to look at whether finerenone, finerenone alone versus empagliflozin alone versus combination therapy alone is better with respect to reductions in albuminuria as a surrogate for CT, CKD endpoints. And so we're looking to enroll um, about 1,000 patients, slightly less, 800, into these three different arms. They'll only be followed for 180 days. It's a short study. Um, and hopefully this will help us to know whether people should be on both or not. I typically will put people on both, A, if they can afford it, and B, if they're high risk. Um, so if they have, you know, a UACR above 300, I'll put them on, on both agents. And so just to wrap up, so hopefully I've explained to you how diabetes is really a heterogeneous uh, kidney disease and that um, clinical pathology and molecular signatures can be very different from one another, that we really have to be on the out, um, outlook for youth onset type 2 diabetes as it's really going to stress our healthcare system, um, that diabetes has impacts beyond just diabetic kidney disease, also in glomerular disease, and that therapies that were derived from diabetic kidney populations can be applied to the non-diabetic kidney population as well. So thank you for listening, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for my approach, you know, I think we, we see this even in people without diabetes where they'll smolder along, their UPC is 0.5, then it's 1.5, then it's 1, then it's 2, you know. And so we're always wondering that question. Um, so I think it, it's a good question regardless. Um, but for me, I think it depends on the magnitude of the proteinuria as well as the severity of the diabetic component on their initial biopsy. So if they had pretty significant diabetic kidney disease, 
Um, so they had, you know, class 2B, which is diffuse mesangial expansion, or if they had Kimmel steel Wilson nodules. I'm probably fine um, as long as their GFR is preserved, tolerating up to three grams. Once it gets beyond that, I think we have to rebiopsy them. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice, though, if we had, like, a molecular profile to know whether it was the diabetes pathways or the lupus pathways causing that proteinuria? Right. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, but I think um, really work. I, I'm hoping to have convinced somebody to start learning about GLP-1 agonists because <laughs> I really think that they're beneficial. Um, so if your patient is overweight in the slightest, I would totally be all over that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it. I think it's probably different for different people. I mean, I think there's probably a significant proportion where they just happen to have both. But we know that diabetes has major impacts on immune dysregulation. Um, and then you take the people with type 1 diabetes who, there is some data to suggest that people with type 1 diabetes um, are overrepresented with respect to, you know, primary glomerulonephritides, which you would expect because we see that autoimmunity runs together, right? Um, but even with type 2 diabetes, we can, we can see some of that. And, and you can, uh, there are some overlapping pathways, too, and you can imagine that, you know, the diabetes exacerbates some of those same overlapping pathways. So I don't know. I mean, it's, we've got um, great, great opportunities for research, Penelope. <laughs> Oh, they've been genotyped. Yeah, so we've, we've, so the people that I presented do not have Modi. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, we know it's an exceedingly rare issue, um, but it definitely happens. Um, it's a great thought to, to consider maybe reduction of that risk if you also are using GLP-1s. There are data out there for that. I don't know if anyone's looking at that, but they should. <laughs> maybe I will. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, that that's something we should be thinking about. And especially, so I'll, I'll even use SGLT2s in some of my type 1s who are really cognizant. And, and uh, you know, I send them home with their keto sticks um, and so forth. But a lot of, uh, some of them are obese, and so it would be interesting to see if we could, we could put them on both to, to help curb that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Oh.
Yeah. Yeah. No, I know we get excited as clinicians because we just want to throw everything at them. <laughs> but that tends to not work so well from the patient perspective. So there are observational and secondary analyses looking to see if there is a difference with ACEs and ARBs um, with the effect of SGLT2s. And it, it, most of the data, not all of the data, but most of the data would suggest that they're equally efficacious. Um, but I think cost in particular um, would put us to, to putting them on an ACE or an ARB very first. So that is always the first thing I, I do. Um, if somebody's, you know, has an A1C of 10, I'm obviously working on that as well. But um, so sometimes I'll do a RAS plus a GLP-1. It just depends on the person's scenario um, and in terms of, you know, their ability to tolerate starting multiple medications. And it's, it's you know, it's a partnership. Yeah, so, so if they have private insurance, yeah, if they have private insurance, there are great copay cards that all of the companies will offer, and it usually reduces it to around anywhere from $10 to $50 a month. 50 is still kind of a lot. Um, if they have Medicare, that's where it's a problem, and unfortunately, that's the vast majority of our patients. I think... You know, EMPA is going to come off um, patent, I think, in 2025. So I think it's a limited time. So we just we have to just muddle through as best we can uh, until that happens. If they have no insurance, there are great um, support uh, programs through each of the companies as well to give it to them free. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, everybody.